Hello and welcome to a very special lockdown edition of the Buzz on Earth News Podcast. It's been a few months since the greatest pandemic of our lifetime has hit the human race on this planet. And if you look at how things have been for a while, you'll realize that despite the crisis we are in, true to the human spirit, we have been trying to triumph in our own ways. And despite the disease, the deaths, the hardship and all the losses, did you realize how things have improved a bit for the natural world? Right, uh, you know, right from the sparrows to the gangetic dolphins, several species have been making a comeback. Many of us, I'm sure, must have seen the news about how penguins were seen exploring the locked down Chicago Aquarium or nilgais or elephants walking on the streets of India. It makes us think, what changed now? Was it because the humans got caged inside? Were we seriously the ones who were responsible for all the catastrophe? Well, a lot of thoughts come to mind, but we will discuss them one by one. Before that, let us have a quick look at all the smart, sustainable news that happened around us while the world was locked down. Some good news on the plastic front. And the good news is that the scientists at Cornell University have developed a new plastic that can be easily degraded into water within a span of just 30 days or so. Researchers believe that this commercial grade plastic can be further modified to replace almost all the known plastics being used in the world today. Though it will require some research, a lot of money and significant time, but isn't this worth a shot? At least in the immediate short term, this plastic will be able to replace fishing gear, which itself is responsible for more than 40% of the global aquatic plastic problem. Jeff Coates, who leads this research team as the professor of chemical biology at Cornell, told that a similar discovery was made in 1949, though not a lot of effort was given into refining it. Coates and his team have been working on the IPPO or isotactic polypropylene oxides commercial angle for more than 15 years now. It's about time we spread enough word about it so that their discovery goes significantly public and changes the fishing scenario altogether. Meanwhile, LEGO is also working on some biodegradable plastics for its toys and you can read about it on our blog at buzzonearth.com. Moving on next, can seaweeds be the source of biofuels? Stay tuned. The invasive seaweed can now be turned into biofuels and fertilizers. Using a mix of acidic and a basic catalyst, the team at the University of Exeter and Plymouth Marine Laboratory have devised a process that releases sugars which can be used to feed a yeast that produces palm oil substitute. The same method also pre prepares the residual seaweed for the next stage of processing called hydrothermal liquefaction. Now, usually the uh, processing of marine biomass like seaweed requires removing it from the salt water washing it in um, fresh water and then drying it. It might seem simple, but the cost of this process itself is so high that it can lead to the entire experiment being shut down. So this time, Professor Mike Allen, who is heading this research team, had one aim, to make the process self-sustaining, that is to make the process economically and uh, environmentally viable. Professor Allen and his team found a workaround in subjecting the organic matter to high temperature and pressure, turning the seaweed into a bio-oil which can be processed further into fuels and high-quality but low-cost fertilizer. For the first time, this study demonstrates that rather than a hindrance, the presence of salt water can be helpful. Now, since we have already headed on to the biofuel bit, did you ever notice that despite there being so many solar and wind energy plants across the continent and across the world, there is no unitive mapping of these energy hubs? This results in multiple dollars being wasted on doing the feasibility study every time some new project has to be established. Probably this will not be the case anymore, according to the University of Southampton. Coming up next is the news.
solar and wind energy sites have been mapped globally for the first time. Researchers at the University of Southampton have mapped the global locations of major renewable energy sites, providing a valuable resource to help assess their potential environmental impact. Their study, published in the Nature Journal called Scientific Data, shows where solar and wind farms are based around the world, demonstrating both their infrastructure density in different regions and approximate power output. It is the first ever global open access data set of wind and solar power generating sites. The estimated uh, share of renewable energy in global electricity generation was more than 26% by the end of 2018 and solar panels and wind turbines are by far the biggest drivers of a rapid increase in renewables. Despite this, until now, little has been known about the geographic spread of wind and solar farms and very little accessible data exists. Okay, too much of scientific stuff? No harm in digressing a little bit? Yeah, so uh, if you remember, we had at the beginning of our podcast talked about COVID-19 and its surprisingly positive impact or effect on the environment. Uh, in fact, as I say that, uh, there is a party of about uh, six parrots uh, flying around and I can see that right outside my window. Though uh, they have been visiting this tree pretty regularly, I think they might be finally settling here. Not to mention the magnificent jungle outlet that uh, just made eye contact with me last evening. I'm going a bit off topic here, but nature is being so beautiful right now that it is hard not to. So yes, um, talking about COVID-19, not all is bad news. Coming up next is some more good news on the quality of air we breathe. Global air quality has improved significantly since the world went on shutdown mode. Levels of two major air pollutants have been drastically reduced since lockdowns began in response to COVID-19. Two new studies in the journal called Geophysical Research Letters find that nitrogen dioxide pollution over northern China, Western Europe and the US decreased by as much as 60% in early 2020 as compared to the same time last year. Nitrogen dioxide, as you may know, is a highly reactive gas produced during combustion that has many harmful effects on the lungs. The gas typically enters the atmosphere through emissions from vehicles, power plants and industrial activities. In addition to nitrogen dioxide, one of the new studies finds that particulate matter pollution, uh, pollution has uh, decreased by 35% in northern China itself. Particulate matter is composed of solid particles and uh, liquid droplets that are small enough, uh, smaller than 2.5 microns, to uh, penetrate deep into the lungs and cause damage. Scientists say that such a significant drop in emissions is unprecedented since air quality monitoring from satellites began in the 1990s, say, say, say scientists. And uh, the improvements in the air quality will likely be temporary but the findings will give scientists a glimpse into what air quality could be like in the future as emission regulations become more stringent. According to the researchers, maybe this is an um, unintended experiment, uh, but could be uh, used to understand better the emission regulations. This is in fact um, some positive news in a very tragic situation. That said and done, um, it does make us ponder, what is the price of fresh air? What is the price of development? How much does clean water cost? And how much are you will, uh, willing to pay for a good life for all people on Earth? We're still looking for answers. So, hang on guys. In one of our blogs, we had talked about these questions in detail, but every time these questions come up, we are left with no answers at all. Sometimes we say that all this development is necessary so that we can put food on every plate. 
But is it truly that? Are we so greedy that we have become so short-sighted? Imagine, just imagine if we could find a way such that development happened and the nature felt happy too. It is a bargain for sure, but it isn't a bargain of who loses or who gets to win. And maybe a compromise of 49-51 is made, given that 50-50 uh, is an ideal situation, nothing in the world is ideal. Maybe uh, being its notorious kid, the mother nature would allow us even 35-65. But the fact that we are dragging it to 0-100 is being too much right now. Maybe it is high time we need to stop that. Probably uh, when the world starts getting uh, back to normal, we will act more sensibly in our own little ways. For each small step makes a real difference for all. Friends, that's all we have in this episode. But before we end the uh, podcast, here is something that had been uh, bogging our mind for a while. Just a small piece of uh, discussion before we leave. While doing our usual research, we came across this uh, amazing fact that whenever a natural calamity happens, it is the women who suffer the most. According to the United Nations, about 80% of the people displaced by climate change are women. More than 70% of those displaced, for example, by the 2010 flooding in Pakistan were women and children. Among those who lost their lives in India, Indonesia and Sri Lanka as a result of the 2004 uh, Indian Ocean tsunami, three times more women died than men. While climate change threatens livelihoods and security around the world, it is women who are bearing the brunt. But why? Well, you'll have to wait till our next podcast for this. Till then, this is Shibodas signing off. Stay safe, live your life well, keep reading and keep supporting buzzonearth.com and join us in making a difference for the good of the planet. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.